For more on the coronavirus uh, crisis and how our government is handling it, I'm joined by former political advisor and commentator Lachlan Harris. Thank you for a return to uh, television and commentating. You haven't been on air in years. It's great to be back. <laughs> a special occasion just for you, Sharon. Yeah, well, and, well, and because you have uh, done some modelling um, with, with uh, your company into how the virus is, is tracking and how governments are around the world are actually moving to respond to yeah, it's the crisis. Really, the modelling is very much about, about predicting political decisions, basically, in terms of what, at what point do political decisions start to change and when, when we expect that in Australia. And what I think is very, very clear is that Australia is in what I call like a pre-capacity line political stage. And you've seen this in France, you've seen it in, in Spain, in Italy, in the US, and even in, in China in the early days. Is, as, as, it's, as it's not clear that the virus is going to push the capacity line, and by the capacity line I mean the total amount of ice see your hospital beds available um, in order uh, available for people basically being impacted by coronavirus and what you're seeing is in that zone where that capacity line is not in view governments of all persuasions are making they don't they lack the political will to make really significant decisions and effectively the kind of the exponential growth of the virus bounds ahead of the political decision-making process. So they only start to bring in these tough measures like self-isolation, travel bans, quarantine, the whole lot, when they think... Oh, we I think travel bans and those sort of things you tend to see in the pre-capacity line sort of yeah. political phase. But what is very, very clear from the experience, particularly in Europe now, um, and particularly in countries where they haven't experienced a pandemic or an epidemic in the recent, recent history, basically, and that's the period we're in now, is countries that have never done this before, they tend to sort of make... They tend to focus on things like like decisions around travel bans, more lighter decisions effectively in this pre-capacity line stage. As that capacity line comes into view, that's when they do this extreme social intervention yeah. stuff. And unfortunately, there's no suggestion that Australia is going to escape that dynamic. And all the numbers we have say that we basically are, are, are parallel tracking both the political and the kind of and the, the health system experience that you're seeing in, in Europe and the US now. That's really, really concerning. And well, three days ago, you said the window for Morrison to act on effective social distancing policies was closing by the hour. He's, he's finally announced that today, although, of course, we don't know how it will be enforced. Um, do you think he took the action too late, seeing as we already have 250 cases? Look, it depends on their strategy. I think what... And the fact that we don't know what their basic strategy is is concerning. Um, I should say that I don't, I'm not... I'm, I don't have a particularly partisan view of this. I think when you look around the world, the experience suggests that all governments of all persuasions who have, don't have experience dealing with these matters have failed to act sufficiently early in order to prevent large-scale community transmission. Now, I would think the reality is that would be the result, whether it was Morrison or Anthony Albarese or anyone else in the, in the chair. I think we would experience that. It's a failing of the system. Um, and I think now it is very, very clear, unfortunately, we, we have lost that opportunity in, in, so in Australia. So you think there's, there's no chance we, we're not going to follow the path now of Hong Kong and Singapore? We're on the other trajectory. Look, Australia has already was, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Singapore was about at about 100 infections and we were at 10. We're now in the mid-200s and they're still sub... Two, and Singapore is sub-200. So, unfortunately, all the data we have basically suggests that that is extremely unlikely. It would require a kind of a counter-black swan mathematical event for us not to follow on the same path, a much more kind of European-US path. Um, and that's also taking into account the kind of political actions that we're taking. We are still very much making political decisions that I would describe as pre-capacity line decisions. They don't have a deep influence. They don't directly... The fact that we're still arguing about things like handshakes and that sort of stuff, in the countries that have acted really severely on this, you've seen it in Europe in the last 24 hours, we're talking about the closing of almost every commercial business outside of, uh, outside of chemists, health facilities and, and supermarkets. That's capacity line or post-capacity line political action. We're not seeing that. The, the really frightening thing is it's unclear in these later in these in outside of South Korea and China we don't know yet if that post capacity line politics will reduce the infection rates there's no data set available there is no country outside 
South Korea and China that have done that, that have effectively reduced infection rates and used their political system to push down that infection rate growth. Singapore has as well, hasn't it? Well, there's countries that have no, acted early. So this is out yeah. of the countries that failed to act right. early and, then, and, and then, have had mass community yeah. transition. Yeah. A lot of the countries, almost, it's not a coincidence, all the countries that acted really, really early and have been successful, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan in particular, they acted extremely early and they had a lot of experience going through these things with MERS and, uh, and H1N1 and others, and so they act much earlier. And it's very much like stimulus. And it seems like their technology is a lot better as well. You know, Singapore has this rapid test, free test that everyone has, and they seem to be able to uh, know if someone leaves, if, if someone who is meant to be self-isolating leaves that location. You know, this is technology they are just, our government just doesn't have, and is, we probably wouldn't want our government to have that either. Oh, the reality is they've done this before. This is our, you know, we're kind of, I said to someone this morning, it's like having your first ever boxing fight and doing it against Mike Tyson. And that's what we're facing. And we are making, all the evidence that we can see suggests that we're making the same set of mistakes at a political level that were made basically in countries that now have widespread community transition, transmission and are taking much more extreme steps. I don't have, see any reason to not assume we are on that track. I don't say that to criticise Scott Morrison. I don't say it to kind of score political points. I don't think any, there is any role for partisanship in the current environment. And I say again, I don't think this is about one part party or person being able to do a better well, job than others. Just on that point about there's no role for partisanship, I actually think that's worrying that we have a Labor opposition at the moment that's not prepared to criticise the government on their handling of this because uh, then no one is saying, you know, there's no one there holding them to account except for some people in the media um, about whether they should be doing things faster or earlier. You know, I do think you need some of that pressure. Uh, and, and at the moment, you know, Labor's I think journalists strategy. still have to do their jobs. I yeah. accept that. But uh, this is my, my view is the virus has identified a vulnerability in our political system and it's taking advantage of that. And that's what viruses do. They find weak spots well, and they what, take advantage what about, of it. Um, you know, the, the Prime Minister and, and the Health Minister and the Treasurer and the Government has been relying on uh, the advice from, from their experts, from their virologists, uh, Brendan Murphy and the whole team uh, in Canberra. You know, you have worked for... A Prime Minister and been in some of these meetings, obviously not when it comes to the coronavirus, but when it was the GFC mm. um, and other, you know, economic yeah, look, crisis. You know, are the experts always right? The reality is expert advice is, first of all, this is what I would say is that, that the expert informed government-led political system is the exact system that's been used in Italy, in Spain, in France, in Germany, in the US. And so it's not the cure-all. There's no reason to say there's experts are taking over, we're going to be fine. The reality is there is real evidence now that in countries that have had no previous experience dealing with these kind of issues, the political system, even with the best possible medical advice, has been overwhelmed by the exponential growth of the virus. I think that is what is happening here in Australia. That doesn't mean the system is flawed. It's the best possible system we have and it's the best system out there, but there is real evidence now that that system is being basically, it's an iterative decision making process which is being taken over by an exponential infection rate growth. And, and that means Australians are right to be deeply concerned, I think, but they also have to acknowledge that in these extraordinary times, it's probably the best possible system available to us. Yeah. Just going back to the, the numbers and the modelling, um, you've said that uh, on, on your social media that people who are comparing this to the flu don't understand maths, the maths of it or the science of it. Look, think about it this way. It's, it's effectively like the, the medical equivalent of a bank run on the hospital system is what we're dealing with. That is all we should be focused on is there is a capacity for people. There is a, there is a total number of ICU and ordinary hospital beds available in Australia. All we are trying to manage now is the basically the process of ensuring those beds are not overrun by demand. That is that now that conversation has never been happen has never happened about the flu as far as I'm aware in Australia in, since, since the early 1900s. Yeah, this is not this is a completely different process. It is a health system process. What is deeply concerning and frightening for many people is once you hit that capacity line, the steps that governments have to take, and they have pro proven that they were willing to take them, have a devastating economic impact. We effectively have to stop people seeing each other. At its extremes, when you're in the Iran situation where Italy is now, France and, and Spain have moved over the last 24 hours, those measures have a devastating impact on the economy. You take those measures to protect the health system. I think there is every certainty we are getting, heading down that path. 
I think it's important we say that. And my one, I guess, piece of sort of, if I was, I was to say my, my concerns at the moment is there is a little bit of a lack of kind of, of genuine communication with the Australian people about this is about one thing, protecting our hospital systems. To do that, we are going to have... Here is the capacity. This is the number of infections at which we would pass that capacity point. Here is our plan to we stop us getting there. We are still being completely protected. Uh, you know, you do get the sense that the government, that the Prime Minister is not levelling with us. And he did, he, you know, improved his tone today. I thought today was really a, a much better performance. But, but still, you know, you get the sense that we... Um, the sense is that he doesn't think or the, the decision is that we can't cope with the real picture or we will panic? I think we are probably reaching a time where it's time for, for radical transparency. I, I use the equivalent if we were heading for a kind of... And, and we have a lot more practice going into these economic recessions. We would be talking about the unemployment rate. We would be talking about the kind of deep economic consequences we're facing. At the moment, there is a sort of a complete lack of a willingness to talk about the future and where we're going to go to. And I think there may be a point of time where that, where that was appropriate. I think that point of time has now Classic. passed. Now, just lastly, before we go to Anthony Albanese's address to the nation, I tweeted that out and now I'm getting everyone uh, on Twitter saying that they might give their own address to the nation. <laughs> What's an opposition leader doing giving one? But look, before we go to that in, in just a moment, um, I want to ask you, your family has Harris Farm yep. markets, of course. Uh, how are they coping with the, with the demand for uh, grocery items that, that are just running out? Yeah, look, I, I'm certainly not a spokesman for Harris, Harris Farm markets, but I would say that I'm sure they, you know, based on conversations I have with my family, they're working very, very hard to make sure that the shopping experience is safe and that there's as much food there as possible. And I would urge people, like, this pandemics, what they do is they hold a, a mirror up to society and they're going to tell us some very, very scary truths about ourselves. And it's really important that people act judiciously and responsibly. But people um, do feel that if they're going to be in quarantine for a couple of weeks, they need to be able to feed their family. That's, and that's completely fair enough, Shari. I'm not suggesting people shouldn't be conservative. Actually, my entire analysis, what it points to, is that the government is genuinely operating behind the eight ball in this situation. And it's because of the system yeah, of government. Yeah, everyone we knew, have. Australians knew what was coming mm. uh, sort of before. And that, that's deeply unfortunate. It doesn't mean the government is kind of losing control of the situation. It just means things are moving faster than political decisions can be taken at the moment. So I would urge people to be very judicious, very responsible and very cautious. Mm. But, but it just in terms of food, there's not a problem with restocking food that, you know, we're not going to run out of, of food in the supermarket. I, look, I certainly am not aware of seeing that. Even in Italy, France, Spain, I've seen no reports of that. My interest in this is the political decision-making process. I think I've never seen no evidence of that happening anywhere around the world.